Has the Denver Broncos defensive line been upgraded? A new addition could change the way the Broncos view the NFL draft on today's brand new episode, Locked on Broncos. You are Locked on Broncos, your daily Denver Broncos podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Broncos country? Welcome into a brand new episode of Locked On Broncos, your daily Denver Broncos podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you so much to all the everydayers out there in Broncos country for tuning in and making us your first listen of the day every single day. We appreciate you so much. Just a reminder, you can get this show for free on YouTube, wherever you get your podcast. So make sure you subscribe or follow. So you never miss out on what's going on with your favorite team every single day, all year long. I'm Cody Rourke, Broncos reporter for Mile High Sports, joined as always by Sarah Bettinger, site expert, predominantly orange.com. Today's episode of Lockdown Broncos is brought to you by Monopoly Go. I admit it. I have a competitive side and it is a bit, and I'm also a big fan with stupid read. Hold on. Today's episode of Lockdown Broncos is brought to you by our friends over there at Monopoly Go. And I admit, I have a competitive side, and I'm also a big fan of Monopoly Go, the mobile hit twist of classic Monopoly. So join your friends to download Monopoly Go, now free, on the App Store or Google Play. Sarah, my friend, the Broncos continuing to add pieces to their roster ahead of the NFL draft, where we might have to look into everything a little bit because they've added to the defensive line, which you and I have talked about is a position of need for Denver going into next week's NFL draft festivities. They add a veteran defensive lineman, veteran Angelo Blackson, a 10-year vet in the National Football League who spent time with various teams. The Broncos will be his sixth team that he has played for. They added him to the mixture as a late, late, late round, I mean like fourth wave free agency addition. And it now makes us question, like, what is Denver thinking about the overall defensive line group going into the draft and going into this upcoming season? Obviously, for them adding a 10-year veteran, that's not necessarily just a small move. There's a reason that they did it. So let's open up the table and discussion. What were your thoughts initially on this signing here? Well, I think initially it's just really good to see the Broncos continually going after defensive linemen. I know we talked about the Malcolm Roach signing earlier in the offseason. Kind of a surprise move. Somebody who hadn't played a full-time role very often, if at all, in the NFL. And Angelo Blackson just adds more experience to that group. Now, does it is, is it the type of move that inspires confidence? Well, let's look at some of maybe what makes him a valuable addition here. Obviously, there's a connection to somebody on the coaching staff. He is not a former New Orleans Saint, however. He was connected, though, to Broncos defensive coordinator Vance Joseph when they spent the 2020 season together in Arizona. Cody, and, and he's had some productive years. I think that 2020 season where he was with Vance Joseph was one of his best in the NFL, had eight QB hits, which at the time was a career best for him. Two and a half sacks, you know, four tackles for loss, 24 total tackles. And he actually parlayed that into a multi-year deal with the Chicago Bears where he had nine quarterback hits the very next season. So the unfortunate thing is that was a few years ago at this point. And, and you want you want guys to be able to be coming off that production, not necessarily, hey, he did this way back when. Now we're talking about a guy who, as of today, he's 31. He'll turn 32 uh, on November 14th, which is one day before my birthday, actually. So shout out to November. Uh, shout out to all the Valentine's Day kids out there like me and Angelo Blackson. But <laughs> Cody, I, yeah, if, if you know, you know. But look, I think this is a fun addition to the Broncos defensive line. It's not necessarily a, a huge needle mover, but what have we been saying throughout the offseason? They continue to raise the floor at key positions, especially in the trenches. Well, you know, you look at his his last season as well, most recent year on file with the Jacksonville Jaguars. I'll have to ask our guy Tony Wiggins a little bit about that, but he appeared in 11 games last year for them. Didn't have a sack, but interesting enough, like he in all his 10 years, he's had four career fumble recoveries. Last year, he had three in totality there, right? And only 13 total tackles combined. Not much of an overall impact for the Jaguars defense. So I'm very curious, like, if we get a chance to talk to Sean Payton, which I imagine I think the pre-draft press conference is going to be sometime early next week, Sarah. So for, you know, there's so many questions I think we have to ask about, like, some of the free agency additions that Denver has made before you can go into the draft, because I'm sure they're going to be asked a ton of questions about quarterback, quarterback, quarterback. What do they plan on doing here? Cortland Sutton not reporting. Do you guys plan to give it? But the question that we all want to know is, like, how do you factor in, like, this move here, does it change your vision for that position room where George Payton clearly outlined 
they've got to be better against the run this season. Well, when you add a guy like Blackson to the mix, who's six foot four, 305 pounds, I mean, to be honest with you, that's a guy that you really want to anchor there. Now, we already know Sean Payton told us that Malcolm Roach isn't going to be an every down guy. Like they expect him to play probably more snaps than he played last year, but he's not going to be an every down guy if you're going to start your drive on the 10 yard line and have to go, you know, 90 yards down the other end. He's not going to be there. So you need guys here at this position specifically that when Malcolm Roach is in, you know, you're getting something good from Roach, right? But when he comes off the field, Who's going in there and can they have the same level of production? Not necessarily in terms of like numbers or sacks or anything like that, but can a guy like Blackson anchor down there inside the A and the B gaps and provide run stoppage? will allow the team to be better in early down situations. To me, that's what I want to see. And there's going to be a lot of competition involved. We'll obviously dive deeper into that here in a little bit on Lockdown Broncos, but Ideally, this addition here, you're getting a guy who's got experience over 128 career games, 42 starts. Like You're not expecting a whole lot out of this guy, so I think you're coming in with the bar set kind of low, but then he might also is in a position to kind of exceed the expectations that we might have for him. So I think this is kind of a, a win-win here for the Broncos, low risk, not necessarily, I don't even think a high reward type thing, but I think you can get value and production out of a guy like Blackson considering it's hard to make it in the NFL for 10 years, specifically even at the defensive tackle position. I didn't know about him really until they signed him and I did my research on him, but that's impressive to be able to be in the league this long without really being the main guy. Yeah, especially as a former fourth round pick, right? So, I mean, that's these guys, they have, like you said, they got to work their butts off every single year in the league just to make it. I mean, especially when you talk about kind of journeyman players. And look, there's nothing inherently wrong with that. The Broncos aren't going to be able to get 99 overall players at every single position, right? And, and that's just the reality of the NFL. And you have to have guys that, Maybe you take a shot on somebody and and it turns out, man, he had a had a really good camp. He ended up having a really good preseason. He's one of our best run stoppers. Like year to year, these things can work out for NFL teams. And ultimately, the low risk that you mentioned, Cody, is going to lead to the the fact that the Broncos, if they don't like what they see, they'll be able to cut ties without with minimal investment you know, behind it. So I think that that's definitely something that you have to look at with a move like this. It's, does it raise the floor? Potentially does it? I mean, if, if that's the case, let's do it. Let's do more things like this. I would love to see the Broncos continually add bodies because you would rather be in a position after the NFL draft and going into training camp where you're saying like, man, I don't know how the Broncos are going to only keep six of these guys on the defensive line. You'd much rather have that kind of a situation than being like, man, I have no idea how the Broncos are going to keep six of these guys, right? Because there's not six worth keeping. There's two very different discussions there. And I think Angelo Blackson kind of, he, he mixes in. He gives you somebody that you feel like, man, he's got a lot of experience. He's played some special teams, was a special teams player of the week back in 2019. So maybe he can go out there and block a kick for you. Or do, you, you already mentioned Cody, the fumble recoveries. He's Johnny on the spot. So you just never know when this kind of investment can pay off for you for at least just a single year. Well, it's also gone to show as well, like you asked Broncos country, this wouldn't have been a consensus move like that they should make or like, oh, this is going to be a good move. But Sean Payton has already come out and said he doesn't care about the consensus. So like, ideally you look at a move like this, it doesn't hurt Denver, right? But you question like, why did they do it? So we're going to find out here. And look, I think now that Blackson being added to the mix of the defensive line, a new look under Jamar Kane, who's taken over as the defensive line coach. Wonder what the philosophy is going to be here, but there will be competition. Malcolm Roach is the expected starter defensive tackle. So how does Blackson and others fit into the mix? Well, we're going to break all of that down on today's brand new episode, Locked on Broncos. How does the Denver Broncos new look defensive line stack up against a unit that last year ranked 30th in the NFL against the run? Have they done enough to improve the defensive line this offseason? Cody and I are going to break that down on today's episode of Locked on Broncos. But we want to say thank you to every single one of you that makes Locked on Broncos your first listen of the day every single day right here on the Locked on Podcast Network. And Cody, for those who view the show on YouTube as well, I mean, we can't appreciate everyone enough on this show every single day for taking time out of your day, however you choose to do so. If you bring us on the treadmill, if you throw us on the TV, if you're if we're on your commute to or from work, we appreciate you so much for rocking with us all offseason as we talk a little Denver Broncos defensive line because this is one of the biggest question marks of the offseason. This is one area of the team, Cody, where 
man, I, I mean, a skeptical is not the right word. It's just downright. It was downright bad last year, and they knew they needed to make upgrades here on the D line. You get a guy like Angelo Blackson in there, but in, com in combination with everything else, do you feel like the Broncos have done enough to upgrade this D line in the 2024 offseason? I think when you factor in the addition of Malcolm Roach, I think you factor in maybe a couple of the younger guys that they have on their roster that they do like, they want to see develop maybe a little bit more. I, I feel okay about where Denver is actually sitting in this regard here. And I think also something we didn't talk about in the first segment here about the addition of Angelo Blackson. I feel like this addition now of him, I think it makes it to where the team is not going to bring back Mike Purcell. I think that's kind of set that ship has sailed a little bit here. If we're reading the tea leaves, this is the move they added him before retaining an in-house guy. That to me says, okay, hey, Mike Purcell's time in Denver more than likely done here. But I think overall, when you look at this position room right now, right, specifically defensive tackle, last year DJ Jones started out the year playing that D tackle position, right? They eventually, they moved him over to defensive end. They moved Purcell into a starting role at D tackle because J Jonathan Harris just wasn't getting the job done at DN, right? So now I think you look at Zach Allen. I think you look at DJ Jones, a defensive end, and think about DJ. Look, he's the type of player that if you want to get somebody else in a different package on the field, you could slide him to D tackle if you want in certain situations and put somebody else at defensive end and vice versa. Like Jamar Cain, to my understanding, wants guys that can play a multitude of roles, which could even include Zach Allen sliding to defensive tackle in certain situations. Though I'm also curious there, like if you slide a guy like Zach Allen down to D tackle, who's a defensive end? you know, opposite of DJ Jones in that situation, right? Is there a guy that can come in and anchor if you're playing that four I or if you're playing a five tech, can they do a really good job? I don't know yet. I don't have the answer to that question. There's so many hypotheticals here, but if we're talking about D tackle specifically, if we think that Zach Allen, DJ Jones is going to start at DN, Malcolm Roach is going to start at D tackle. We know he's not going to be an every down player. That means that there are other players on the defensive line that will factor into the rotation. And look, right now that features Elijah Garcia, who's six foot five, 302 pounds, gonna be a 30 year player. Like he is a, a guy that I think the team really, really likes, but he's a developmental guy, right? And then you also have Jordan Jackson, former New Orleans Saint, who's also six foot four, but he's a little bit undersized in terms of 294 pounds. Might be a little bit more of the guy you wanna move athletically. Aside from that, you do have DJ, you do have Malcolm there. But then outside of that, you have Rashard Lawrence, who the team added in the offseason. He's a six foot two, 308 pound player that has also has former familiarity with Vance Joseph as well. So if you factor in that to the equation, you might be banking on the fact that maybe Inyoma Uwazurike, can he be reinstated? Obviously, he's going to be eligible for that, I think, what is it, in July? But mm -hmm. that's already when training camp is going on. And so he's going to be behind the curve. We don't even know if he's been training. So you can't even factor in. Uwazarike into the equation here right now I think that there's an open competition behind Malcolm Roach and it's going to be Angelo Blackson Jordan Jackson Elijah Garcia and I think Rashard Lawrence those are the four guys I think are going to compete for rotational minutes behind Roach and you'd see you'd love to see the Broncos maybe add another couple of bodies to that rotation I yeah. think that's kind of to answer that question of like have they done enough you did a great job outlining what they've done to say they've done enough at this point, Cody, I think would be a little bit of uh, a reach uh, at the, at best. I mean, it would be the most optimistic outlook on every single one of those guys coming to fruition. And right now, like I think about it this way, what the Broncos are one injury to DJ Jones or Zach Allen away from what at the defensive yeah. line. I mean, Ooh. and that's bad news right now. So I think, I think where you're at right now with those two guys healthy, you feel like, okay, yeah, there's, there's something there. There's something brewing, but I think in, in my opinion, if I'm looking, if, if I'm pulling out my phone and I'm seeing how much batteries on the charge right there, it's probably like a 56% kind of thing where some, some people, they see the 56% and they're like, my phone basically dead and other people see the 56 percent and they're like that's the highest it's been in weeks so i i mean that's kind of where the broncos d line is at right now is like in the eye of the beholder where are you at when you're at 56 percent on your phone charge are you saying well we got to go plug it into the charge we need more I, that's kind of where i'm at cody i feel like 56% is just a couple minutes away from the phone basically being dead. The Broncos D line is one injury away right now from being in absolute disaster mode for one of their top guys to go down. So that leads to, man, you need to continue to be pursuing these guys who are willing to take vet minimum deals and free agency. You may need to, you know, obviously we'll talk about the NFL draft upcoming, but to me, have they done enough at this point? 
I would say no. But again, mm -hmm. the most optimistic viewpoint for each of these guys, hey, Rashard Lawrence, he could be the next Shelby Harris. I mean, Angelo Blacks, he could give you one really good year. You never know what Malcolm Roach is capable of becoming after playing a minimal role with the Saints or a rotational role with the Saints. I think if you optimistically look at it, you're saying, yeah, they've done, they've done some good things to add bodies to that mix. But from where I'm at in terms of proven depth, at the defensive line right now after ranking 30th in the NFL in rushing yards allowed last season. Ain't no way I'm saying this Broncos team has done enough on the D-line as of right now. Well, you are one uh, Zach Allen or DJ Jones injured away from moving Drew Sanders to defensive end at this point. I mean, that's, <laughs> that, that's where things are at in terms of the Broncos. And to, I'll be honest with you too here, Sarah. Like, for me, I, I kind of have been a little surprised that Denver hasn't necessarily added a defensive end this offseason, right? And like D end is almost as equally important, in my opinion, to stop in the run as the D tackle position. And last year, simply, it wasn't good enough. And right, we even talked about it. We did an episode of Lockdown Broncos earlier in the week about the Broncos pass rushers and how we think they can take the next step forward and how I think a lot of it, you're really banking on the defensive line being much better to help them out to give them more opportunities, get one-on-one -on -one pass rush opportunities against tackles to get after the quarterback. But, you know, we're this is a huge hypothetical. Like, the, the question that we have about D-tackle is simply not answered just yet, though we're optimistic and, and maybe a little bit hopeful that they are going to have a plan in place. Part of me also wonders, too, when we look at guys like Jordan Jackson, we look at guys like Elijah Garcia, are these guys that are viewed as, like, A-gap, B-gap players, are they also viewed as guys that can maybe play a little bit on the perimeter there in that five tech or in a six eye if they're lined up and there's a tight end right next to them. Like how does this factor in the equation, especially when Denver's running a three, four style defense, that's where I think you have to have synergy, not only just from your defensive line group, but also the guys rotating in and that impacts your production at linebacker, which then impacts your production in terms of pass rush, which impacts your production on the back end and the secondary, which also has questions itself. Like, is Denver making the necessary steps to improve their defense from what it was last year? I say we can make that a questionable argument at best right now, considering the departure of Justin Simmons, not knowing who the cornerback two is going to be opposite of Patrick Sertan. Like this position right here, in my opinion, is the one domino that I think is going to impact every other position on defense. And that's why I'm a little skeptical as well. I think they still need to do a little bit more at this position. And Broncos country, we want to hear from you. And look, the question we're going to ask here, Who's drafting a defensive lineman still on the table for the Broncos in the beefier rounds of the NFL draft next week? That's something we're going to answer on today's episode, Lockdown Broncos. Will the Denver Broncos still look at drafting and adding to the defensive line in this year's NFL draft after signing veteran Angelo Blackson to a one-year deal? A lot of questions about the Broncos defensive line group, but there are no questions when it comes to where you're going to get your Broncos coverage every single day, all year long. And that is here on the Lockdown Broncos podcast. So thank you so much to all the every dares out there for tuning in and making us your first listen of the day every single day. The buildup for the draft continues here as we continue to highlight the Broncos defensive line position, which we've talked about as outside of quarterback. This is the one position we've probably had a lot of questions surrounding and maybe just trying to figure out could solving this question here lead to more success for Denver defensively. I think that there are arguments to be made on either side there, but I mean, Sarah, I think we got to ask the question here with the addition of a veteran like blacks into the mix. Does this make it to where the Broncos will still draft a defensive lineman in the 2024 NFL draft with obviously eight picks that they have that could fluctuate, could change. They could add more. They could reduce some if they make some moves here, but do you still think it's as big of a priority to them after this addition? I think it has to be. I think you, you've you added a veteran here who's probably going to be around for a year, and you're kind of just seeing what happens. Look, I, I watch a lot of baseball, Cody. I'm a Cubs fan, though I represent a lot of different teams on here. One of the things the Cubs are really great at is going after some relief pitchers who are discarded by other teams, and you kind of just take a risk on these relief pitchers and say, he had a terrible ERA last year. What could he do this year with our coaching? I kind of view what the Broncos are doing at some of these different free agent signings, like the Cody Barton signing at linebacker. A lot of Washington Commanders fans were not upset to see him go, similar to Alex Singleton with Philadelphia Eagles fans. Maybe the Broncos are taking the approach of like the, you know, you've mentioned money ball and things like that. Maybe they're taking the approach to say, look, we want to get these guys in the building and see what they can do for a year, but it doesn't necessarily have a bearing on, hey, we wouldn't pass on this guy in the draft because we signed this guy in free agency. I kind of get the vibe that that's where 
really almost every Broncos free agent signing safe for maybe Brandon Jones, the safety kind of gives me that vibe to say we wouldn't pass on this guy in the draft just because we signed X, Y, or Z could be Josh Reynolds, Malcolm Roach, Angelo blacks could be just about anybody in this year's free agent class, because the Broncos are going with a, as we hoped for a bulk buying approach, including out of house free agents and in-house guys. I say on the defensive line, you've got to make sure it, it could be even a trade down scenario in the first round. I mean, a Byron Murphy or or Johnny Newton, those two guys are considered first round potential D linemen. I've seen Mason Smith guy we've mocked on on this show before. He's now being projected in upwards of the second round potentially out of LSU there. So there's guys that are going to be available that I think if you have a chance to get a real difference maker, this is a premier position in the NFL today, especially if you can get them on a rookie contract. We're seeing these guys get paid a lot of money, Cody. So if you can get a premier D lineman and get him on a rookie deal, that's a big, big move for your team. And it's it's something that the Broncos will have to consider. And your likelihood of ever finding a guy like a Chris Jones is very, very hard. Guys like Chris Jones, guys like the Aaron Donalds of the world are very, very hard to find. I, I like the point that you mentioned. I'm also kind of... Like if Denver is truly operating with this approach, Sarah, I like that. And it tells me a lot necessarily about maybe how George and Sean and that combined brain trust, how they're thinking about maybe assembling this roster. Like we talked about it before the offseason began. Should the Broncos take the approach of just signing, not being not, not making any big splashes, but going out there and signing guys to one-year deals? What have they done so far? With the exception of Brandon Jones, they've really kind of gone out and got signed guys to one- and two-year deals that have added depth to positions that we feel like they needed to add depth to and maybe a couple of potential starters, but nothing big, nothing in your face. And also saying at this point, now we're going to approach the NFL draft with eight overall picks where, you know, we've heard the term dart throws be thrown out there a little bit. We've also heard the term about them being aggressive for the right guy. Like if they go out and they get a quarterback that they want, then, you know, certainly gives them some fluid, you know, mobility to maybe kind of structure how they want to build this team going forward. Like now Denver's in a position where if they truly believe we're going to add these guys at cost effective deals, but we're going to go out there. And if there's a better player, a guy that we feel like can emerge and to be a younger and better player at that position, and it gives us a chance to get better and also have flexibility. When we talk about rookie deals, we're going to take that chance. I like that for Denver. It's playing smart, but it's also being aggressive in the same exact breath there. Now I think you got to ask ourselves the question, like, in terms of priority, right, does it shift, right? Obviously, earlier in this week, we found out Cortland Sutton was not going to report to the team's voluntary program. He wants a new contract. And that we've talked about the wide receiver room there. We know quarterback is probably the biggest priority for Denver. But does wide receiver now maybe take a little bit more precedence over a defensive tackle at this position? Like, how do you feel about that from a change standpoint with this news that came out this week? I think in round one, it certainly could vault receiver above defensive line. You know, when you're talking about the Broncos potentially going top 100 picks, I think you look at the best guy available at pick 76, that's going to be tough to project this far out. But I think, Cody, when you talk about priority in the draft, wide receiver with Cortland Sutton's future being in, in uncertain at this point, Tim Patrick being back on just a renewed one year deal. That is a position that right now the Broncos long term future is very much a question mark. The defensive line, at least you have Zach Allen, a big money free agent. And then, quite frankly, I mean, DJ Jones was a big money free agent and Malcolm Roach. That's nothing to scoff at what they signed him for either. So I think that there's players there that you feel like can be core players for you going forward. Who do the Broncos have that's a core player at receiver going forward? Is it Marvin Mims? We just don't know yet. We got to see it. I mean, he was a second round pick, so maybe you project him in that spot. But I think that is a fair point to make to say that receiver right now is definitely higher on the list depending on who's sitting there. I mean, we talked about the idea of Romo Dunze potentially sitting there at 12. Like, what if that happens? You take, I mean, you run to the podium with that card right there and you make that pick even uh, over a, you know, for sure over a Bo Nix or Michael Penix, but we'll see. I, I just think, Cody, you got to, you got to look at this this team in a two year slot right now. Where, the, where are the Broncos going to be at at this point next year on the D line at wide receiver? You weigh those options. I think wide receiver takes precedence right now, but I still think in the NFL draft, you go after some D linemen and you get tougher on the defensive front. 
Um, Broncos country, we want to hear from you in terms of your thought process. What should the Broncos do? Obviously, no second round pick, but when it comes to the third round and the later rounds, Denver has a lot of capital. You feel like they could add a prolific player at that position. Let us know what you would do if you were Broncos GM George Payton and head coach Sean Payton. In terms of making this decision here, have the Broncos done enough on the defensive line? to avoid adding in the NFL draft. Let us know if you're watching Lockdown Broncos or you're listening to the show wherever you get your podcasts or available on YouTube. But that'll wrap up today's episode of Show and Look Broncos Country. We appreciate you so much. We are going to dive into an NFL analyst or also insider's mock draft on tomorrow's episode of the show. Peter Schrager, very well connected. Doesn't put out a lot of the mock drafts, but before the draft, he puts out his final, his only mock draft, essentially, based on the information, the conversations he's having around the NFL. Where does he have the Broncos going? And do we agree with the consensus as to where he went? You'll get that much more on tomorrow's brand new episode of Lockdown Broncos. We'll see you then.